You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagun Yedile and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Body Banter. My name is Claudia Krebs, and I'm joining you from the unceded territory of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam Nations here in Vancouver, Canada. And I'm so thrilled to have two wonderful guests here today. We have Lina Alkamash and Gordon Findlater. Welcome to Body Banter, both of you. Nice to meet you. Nice to be here. Hi. So, Lena and Gordon, you know each other from, uh, Lena, your time in Edinburgh. Now, Lena, you're now a PhD student in Vancouver at UBC, but you met Gordon um, back when you were doing your master's degree in Edinburgh. Tell me how you met. Yeah, well, I'll let you go first, Lena, because <laughs> you probably remember me more than I remember you at the start, at least. Yeah. <laughs> how many were in the class at that time? I can't remember. We were 14. Yeah, we were 14. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I remember it was the first day, like the um, introductory day of our master program. And we were all gathered in the anatomy theater in the University of Edinburgh for the introduction of the program. And then Gordon was sitting in front of me and I was like, oh, is it Gordon like sitting in front of me? That's really cool. And then he turned back to look at me. He said, hi, I'm Gordon. I'm like, is he really talking to me? <laughs> Gordon? <laughs> And I was so excited. I said, I, I kind of know who you are. <laughs> I'm Lena. That was that. Yeah, so this is yeah. how we met. <laughs> that's, that's so that's wonderful. Yeah. Gordon, so you're a prophet Edinburgh. Tell me more about that. And well, then was, how you met Lena. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I was pro I've now since retired from Edinburgh University, and I'm physically located in the north of Scotland, which is my home homeland, hometown. And so I retired back here you know, a couple of years ago now. But uh, yeah, I, I I had a notion to set up a master's in human anatomy to try and plug the gap in anatomy teachers because we we're really short of anatomy teachers. And so I had this master plan that if we ran a master's course in human anatomy, then we would have some knowledgeable candidates for future teachers and probably run a PhD program so that people with a good knowledge of anatomy could subsequently go on and do a, a doctorate put in some kind of anatomical subject. And then they would become an academic in anatomy. That's pretty much what Lena's doing, actually, in many respects. She's fulfilling that, uh, that, uh, that the plan that I had for the course. But yeah, so I mean, I think it must be about the third year that we ran the course. And uh, we started off with nine students and it expanded up. I think the most we ever had in one year was about 30 odd students. So we're meeting a need for certainly, you know, people wanting to learn a bit more about anatomy. And yeah, and I remember Lena, who was a regular visitor to my office for one reason or another. But it was an invariably a pleasant meeting, I have to say. It was it was always a, always ended up laughing one way or another. Uh, so that was it, really. Yeah. That's so wonderful. I always find that the uh, very special bond between sort of teacher and student is something. Um, quite remarkable um, for, and, and something that I feel very privileged to be part of. And it's so beautiful to see that between the two of you, even, you know, sort of uh, in this in this conversation that that bond is still very much there. Um, yeah. I agree with that, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, Gordon, I'll start with you. So you obviously had a, a fantastic career in anatomy and you created this master's program to really pass on um, your love for anatomy and um, the knowledge around anatomy to the next generation. Um, what's your favorite thing about anatomy in general? I think it is just uh, how remarkable the body is and how integrated everything is. And, you know, when I started anatomy back in, I can actually say in the last century, that is absolutely true. Um, I can remember that it was a kind of discovery, you know, it was just a whole, you know, the first incision that I made and revealing things. And uh, I absolutely, was, from that day on, I just absolutely loved it. 
And uh, for the, I mean, I taught anatomy for 35 years and, and I still teach anatomy, but I still still enjoy it as much today as I did when I first started doing it. And I think it's just, it's just a wonder, a wonder of the body. And despite the fact we're all the same, we're all fundamentally different inside as well. You know, I always say to people that, you know, we all, we all basically the same, we all got heads and, you know, eyes and ears, but we're all subtly different. And that is actually true inside the body. And we're all basically the same, but we're all subtly different. And uh, when I'm teaching surgeons, I always say we're teaching you to expect the unexpected because you just can't make assumptions that everything's exactly where it is. And in all the years I've dissected, you always find something unusual, something strange, or something you know, un- as I say, unusual and different. Yeah. So yeah, as, and as I said, it's just a, uh, a it's a journey of discovery, anatomy. So an embryology, I can I could go on a bit length for embryology because I think that's one way of understanding anatomy. I think people think they can just teach anatomy by regurgitating facts, but I think uh, an understanding of the underlying structure and its relationship to function, and uh, some of the areas of anatomy are very difficult to understand unless you actually have a sound knowledge of embryology, how it got to be the way it is. So I think one of the, and I think unfortunately embryology has disappeared a lot out of the modern curriculum, but if you really want to understand your anatomy, get your head around embryology. I couldn't agree more. I'm a a late convert to the embryology um, uh, part of anatomy. So as many students, I struggled with it when I had to take my embryology course. I of course had Keith Moore's book and I diligently read it and tried to understand, but it was hard. And it wasn't until later, as I was teaching anatomy, that I found myself going back to Keith Moore's book over and over again um, to understand it. And only once I understood the development could I actually teach the anatomy effectively. So I I fully agree with that. But it took me a while uh, to to realize that. Well, funny, when when I was teaching embryology, I always thought I understood it. But every time I taught it, I learned something else. And I said, like, oh, I don't know I understand it. So I thought yeah. I understood it before, but the more I taught it, the more I actually understood it. And I think if you think about cavities, like the peritoneal cavity, just to look into an abdomen and try and work your head around the spaces, okay, you can, you can give them names, but the understanding comes from how it got to be like that. So once you get your head around the embryology, the abdominal cavity, it, it makes sense. You know, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Lena, what was it like for you to start learning anatomy with such an experienced and thoughtful teacher? Actually, I I have I don't have a very good memory when I started learning anatomy in my undergrad. I wasn't I wasn't very courageous. Like I thought that maybe this is not the field that I would enjoy. Really, truly, I wasn't I wasn't enjoying it very much. And then it only started like becoming my passion when I started teaching it. Like after I graduated and I, I joined my first um, job um, teaching in the university, this is when I really started to, to learn it differently and to, to love to, to teach it. And this is when I started to look at things differently. Um, and then I think with, with, like, with the years, with like more teaching, with my humble teaching experience, <laughs> this is when I um, started to look at th- things differently and like to enjoy things differently. And, and now it is really my, my passion to the extent that if I'm on a day, like if I'm, if I'm in, a, in a bad mood, go lab is like something that would make me feel better and would change the whole day for me. Um, yeah, I agree with Gordon. Um, every every time I look at things, like if if I'm planning for a teaching or a session, if every time I look at things uh, in a new time, like in a new session or a new teaching, I see things differently. I enjoy things differently. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. surprised to hear when you. I'm surprised when this when I if ever I'm in a bad mood. I can't imagine you ever being in a bad mood, Lena. <laughs> <laughs> So when we're when we're doing our anatomy and when we're teaching anatomy, I know we're not supposed to have favorites, but we kind of do. So, Gordon, what's your favorite body part and why? It's very difficult. It depends on. I suppose the favorite body part is the bit I'm teaching, but that's not very helpful to you. I think, <laughs> I think a body part where I can actually explain function 
can relate it absolutely to, to, to anatomy, if you follow. I mean, I just think like, I think like the rotator cuff, I mean, everybody, I say everybody knows, you think of the rotator cuff, and we always think it just stabilizes the shoulder joint, but when you look at the biomechanics of the shoulder and just how subtly the, the, the rotator cuff stabilizes the shoulder, people just think they physically pro bones together, but they don't. So they, they, they negate dislocating forces. And I think it's when you have that opportunity to teach something functional and you can see pennies dropping. You know, you, you ask a student, you understand, and the, the, the head's nodding, but you can see in the eyes that, the, the, you know, the eyes tell the story, you know, and as soon as you, you, you can tell somebody's eyes that they've got the message. And I think if you get a topic where you can see the penny drop, you think, oh, they've got it now, and you know that. And I think... It's easy, I would say limbs, you know, I'm not, you know what's my favorite body part? I think I, I like biomechanics and I think it, you can explain structure related to function a lot there. But if it comes to cavities, then it's the embryology underlying the cavities. I think you can learn cavities from embryology. You can learn limbs by looking at the biomechanics and my, you know, that, that approach. I don't that's know if that's so really cool. Happened. And I love that you chose the rotator cuff because it is such a uniquely human thing as well with the development of our upper limb and the reach that we need to have there. When I talk about musculoskeletal, I always frame it as the epic battle between mobility and stability. stability and, um, and I find that epic battle is just wonderful yeah. in, the, in the rotator cuff. It's just this beautiful compromise between mobility and stability. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me, tell me more about your approach to the rotator cuff there. Well, my, uh, the way I talk about the rotator cuff, I always think about, I, I start by looking at deltoid. I mean, the deltoid is a lovely muscle. I mean, so, uh, so I need to get out more if I think about lovely muscles, but deltoid is a great muscle. I mean, it's, it's, it's functional aspects. It's got it's a flexor of the shoulder, it's an extensor, it's an abductor. But if you look at the, the fibers of deltoid, they're on paddle at the shaft of the humerus. So when deltoid contracts, it's got to pull the humerus up into that coracochromial arch. So somehow though, you've got to negate that upwards force, and that's where the rotator cuff comes in. If you look at the orientation of the fibres of subscapularis, infraspinatus, teres minor, they have a subtle dip pulling down, which negates the pulling up, and you're left with the abducting component. And so you can, you know, and it's, 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 it's lovely muscle, you know, and a lovely, so that's how I, that's how I talk about rotator cuff. They don't just physically pull bones together, they negate the dislocating forces. And the other thing, I think about if you think of those big muscles acting across the shoulder, like pectoralis major, latissimus dorsi, teres major, they are big, powerful muscles, and they have all the ability to pull the, the head of the humerus directly out the glenoid. But so if you have a, a if you injure your shoulder and you go to the physiotherapist and it's a rotator cuff injury, they give you these big elastic bands and you stand there and you just sort of do these external rotating and internal rotating exercises. And the guy, the big muscly guy who goes to the gym, he thinks, oh, no, I need to be pulling big weights. So having damaged his rotator cuff, as soon as he goes to the gym, he gives himself a further injury because he hasn't strengthened up the rotator cuff by doing these simple little exercises that the physiotherapist has done. So you can, you know, you can bring it in, that, 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 that approach to the rotator cuff. I really like that. It reminds me, I, I once did an elective in Banff in the, in the Rocky Mountains in orthopedic surgery of all things. And we did several rotator cuff uh, repairs from uh, folks who were um, doing rodeos. So again, big shoulder movements and not enough strengthening of the small muscles um, yeah, yeah, yeah. around the rotator cuff. So they tear the rotator cuff and it yeah. would need to be repaired. That's right, they do until more injury. That's right, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, Lena, what's your favorite body part? I guess um, I would say the intestines because I love how like I can hold the intestines in the lab and I can show uh, students like the vasa recta and the arcades. They look very neat, <laughs> and I I enjoy I enjoy looking at the intestines. I think there is although they are just a tube, but there's a lot to see inside. There's a lot of um, hidden hidden beauty inside. <laughs> yeah. That's so wonderful. I've never bonded with the intestines, so I'm glad that they're your favorite. <laughs> it's funny. Well, when you said intestine, my first thought was, really? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but if you were to ask me about it, I would say the histology of the gut is probably of more interest to me than just the, the gut itself. But I think I would get, you know, because that's where the function is in histology. 
you know. And that's another subject area which is neglected quite significantly, certainly over here in the UK. Histology was a, a made subject when I did anatomy, but it seems to be a kind of Cinderella subject over here now. Uh, yeah. Microanatomy is interesting, yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's, it, there seems to be a, a bit of a decline in histology um, instruction, which is such a pity because it is uh, absolutely uh, beautiful and fundamental to linking structure and function. Um, yeah. If you, you have to, in my opinion, you got to be able to go from the macroscopic, like holding the intestines right down to the microscopic villi to understand the function in the different areas. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I agree absolutely with that. Yeah. So if we have favorites, we might also have areas we don't like so much. Um, Gordon, what's your least favorite body part? Or do you even have a least favorite body I, part? I would say the one I find the least interesting to there's probably two, and that is uh, the endocrine system. Because there, when it comes to anatomy, I mean, I, 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 endocrines were kind of neglected in the curriculum here in Edinburgh for a long while. And they introduced a module on the endocrine system, and I was asked by the endocrinologist, the guy who was running it, that he thought we've got a lovely, wonderful lecture theatre in Edinburgh, you know, very traditional, very steep rate. A body would have take, been taken into the middle of the lecture theatre and so his idea was that I should maybe take a body into the middle of the lecture theatre and dissect out the endocrine system and now there speaks somebody who has absolutely no idea how to get to the anatomy of the endocrine system. Histology wise I think the endocrine system is wonderful but from a gross anatomical point of view you can, you can show a pituitary, you can show a thyroid, you can show a pancreas but the interesting aspects of that is at the histological level but as a system, I think my the one I find the least interesting to teach is the, the renal system. I always say a couple of kidneys, a couple of tubes, a storage facility and another tube, and that's, that's it. You know, I mean, a bit slightly, uh, a wee bit sort of, like, sort of what's yeah. the word? Filtration yeah. and plumbing. So. That's it, that's it, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of get excited about it, but I teach it, I still teach it, and I teach it with as much enthusiasm about teaching the other part of the body, but... I wouldn't, it's not my favorite area, you know, but that is, it's, it's, it's marginal, you know. That's so interesting. Um, I quite like the, um, the renal system, but I like it because I, I teach it in combination with the physiology and then that's, things start getting super exciting. That's where it gets interesting. Physiology, that's a base balance. That's a different thing altogether. And I can, there's a lot of physiology in the, I mean, there's not so much anatomy. There's a lot of physiology. And uh, maybe I don't like it because I could never get my head around the physiology and the acid base balance. And it's, it's, it's very complex, you know. You know, do you also feel like physiologists are just the smarter people at the university compared to us lowly anatomists? Definitely not. Not, no. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't say anything else, can I? <laughs> so we'll leave it at that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> can't say anything else. Well, I would like to think I, I teach functional anatomy at a level of which make, helps you understand the anatomy, but I, I, I wouldn't claim to be a physiologist at all, not at all. Yeah, I think that that's a whole new level. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Lena, how about you? What's your least favorite body part? Uh, I guess it's the whole region. It's not a body part. It's anything related to the pelvis. <laughs> I think because it's something that is least dissected during like anatomy courses so during my undergrad it was it wasn't like really an area that we covered like very well um so I usually during my master yes of course we we did like extensive dissections in the pelvis but still like it's something that I always feel that has a lot of mysterious information that I have to to learn and even like uh, when teaching the pelvis and any organs in the pelvis and the relationships between the organs and all that, it's something challenging to to explain and to convey to students. So I, I think as a student and as an, an instructor, I sometimes don't prefer the pelvis. <laughs> can, I, can I just, I mean, I think the thing about the pelvis and the perineum, I think it's a great, I like difficult areas to teach. I think they're a challenge, you know, head and neck and, and, and the pelvis and the perineum particularly. And 
I think that's I. I was I was, as Lena will uh, testify. I chalk and talk. I did chalk and talk. I drew things, and I don't think there's, there's no better medium than chalk on a blackboard. You can do. I mean, whiteboards don't do it at all, and these smart boards are just not smart at all. But blackboards, and 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 I think the one of the best ways to teach a perineum is to develop it from a, a from in a drawing. So, and the thing about drawing, it paces you so that the students can actually follow what you're doing. If you just stick up, you know, slides and you talk your way through the slides and students get lost, whereas when you're drawing, you're slowing down and it gives them the opportunity to take in what you're doing. But I think the one of the best ways to teach perineum is to chalk and talk, describe what's there, even if you can't necessarily see it in a good dissection, but then take them to a dissection and say, well, that's the theory behind what we're, we're looking at here. And this is a reality, and then take them to pelvis and show them, uh, you know, the, the perineum, show them the initial anal fossa, so pretend all vessels and a bony pelvis, just show them the basic ligament structure associated with it, and they can build it up from there. But I think that's a great opportunity to develop it slowly, and then you know, introduce. I, mean, I agree, it's a difficult. You can't really dissect a perineum very, very well, to be fair. But there's no denying it's a very important area. Yeah, absolutely. When I first started at UBC, um, my first lecture in anatomy was pelvis and my second lecture was perineum. I felt like I'd just been tossed off oh, the 10 meter diving board into the deep end and I just had to, to do it. Yeah. So I, um, I've learned to really love this area and uh, love teaching it as well. And I agree, it's really hard, especially when you start out, but it's... Um, I, I also like the challenge. I'm with you there, Gordon. I also want to pick up on the chalkboard because that's a huge thing. Um, I see this over and over again, and I'm a bit worried it's becoming a lost art. Um, the, the chalk talk in anatomy, the drawing conceptually on the board. So here at UBC, we, we have this tradition of anatomists, the, the founder of our anatomy department in the 1950s, uh, Friedman, he was famous for his chalk drawings. He would do a lecture on the posterior abdominal wall where he would start and, and he would build up everything and then he'd shade it over and he'd put the next layer on all on the same chalk drawing. And legend has it that he finished off with the anterior abdominal wall. And the last thing he put on was the belly button. And um, when I first heard about this, I was like, I want to emulate that. I want to do that lecture on in chalk like that. So I spent hours practicing and I just couldn't get it together. And I'm, I was very sad that I never had the opportunity, of course, to see Dr. Friedman do that lecture in the 60s and 70s. Anyway, then Dr. Vogel, um, who's here at UBC, he learned from Friedman and he also does a lot of chalk drawings. And I've learned so much. Uh, just by watching that and watching that approach. And in fact, when we built our new building um, 15 years ago, I remember the architects were coming and saying, so what are we putting behind the lectern? And Dr. Vogel said, chalkboards, we're putting chalkboards there. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so they did. And now it's seen as this archaic thing. Why do you have, have chalkboards? And it's like, because we're anatomists. I think mathematicians and anatomists are the yeah. chalkboard lovers on campus. Yeah, absolutely. I had the same battle in Edinburgh when they were uh, modifying the, they, they couldn't do too much the structure of the, the space because it's what they call a grade A listed building. But they wanted to remove the blackboards and put in whiteboards. And I drew the line at that. I said, definitely not. Uh, and they said, but it's not, it's not, you know, you've got computers here, they've got to have fans, they've got to be drawing in chalk dust. As much just have to get rid of the computers, but you're not getting rid of the blackboards. <laughs> and so we stuck with the blackboards. And uh, yeah, so, and, and whiteboards don't do it because you can do so much with chalk that you can't do with a, a, a pen, you know, or, or a, you know, a whiteboard pen because you can use the side of the chalk. You can actually shade, as you said, you can get a nice straight line or a, a sharp line, or you can get a fuzzy line. You know, you can expect, you can do a lot with chalk you can't do with anything else, you know? Yeah. yeah, no, I agree. I'm so happy to to be talking to a fellow chalkboard lover because, um, yeah. Have you heard about those Japanese chalks um, that are just absolutely, they're like butter on the board. They're absolutely fabulous. They have uh, beautiful pigmentation. I forget the name. Oh, well, we'll add the name afterwards. Um, are they, is that on blackboards? 
Yeah. There's not a number. So yeah, I'd, I'd like to know about that. Definitely. Yeah, I'll I'll um I'll send that to you. Absolutely. <laughs> so um, what's your most memorable anatomy moment? You so you're looking back on a on a long career, many moments of teaching, many students who've um, who've been inspired by you. When you look back like that, what would you say is the most memorable moment for you? I think up until 2006, the Anatomy Act in the New United Kingdom only allowed bodies to be used for the teaching of anatomy. You couldn't carry out any surgical procedures or anything like that. And the and as the 2006 law changed, and shortly after that, I was approached by some a surgeon in the, the local hospital in Edinburgh, the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh, they had a 22-year-old young man who had an osteosarcoma of his scapula, which had started to invade in his chest wall, and they wondered if they could get access to a body to try and see if they could dissect this tumour that was going to be very complicated, but in order to understand what they might be dealing with, they asked if they could get access to a body. So as, as the act had been changed to allow such things to be done, you know, I said yes, by all means. So they came to the anatomy department, and the whole surgical team came. Out, came. There was a there was the, the cardiothoracic chap, there was the, the neuro because the, 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 the vertebral column spinal cord was being affected. You know, there's a vascular surgeon. They all came and as a team, they spent an entire day working out how they would approach this, this tumour. And that's what made me, it was a wonderful example of where somebody who had left their body to the medical school could save somebody else's life. And just, not, not just for the medical, I mean, when you think about it as well, uh, when, when somebody leaves their body to the medical school, the number of people who benefit from that, because it's the medical students who learn from that individual and the number of people who are treated subsequently by all these doctors. But that, to my mind, you know, it really made me, the impact of that, that day was with me for a long time after that, how this, this person who'd left their body at the medical school had the potential to save somebody's life. You know, and I, that, that was probably one of my, my, one of my most memorable moments. Definitely. That's so beautiful. I actually have goosebumps as you're you're telling that story because um, I I think about our donors a lot and the um, the impact that they have, as you said, and something quite concrete like that, where you have a whole team coming in to um, to practice a complex surgery to save a person's life the next day in the operating theater. Um, that's that's huge, right? Yeah, that's it's akin to organ donation, right? Where you you have that very direct link between a uh, deceased body and and uh, sort of the giving that gift to the next person. Um, that's really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And Lena, for you as sort of somebody at the beginning of your anatomy career, thinking back both for you know your teaching practice as well as your learning as a student so far what has been the most memorable moment for you i think um i would also relate back to the to the story of um respecting donors in the lab and the relationship between students and the donors i think my most memorable um moment in um as a student was um towards the end of the year during my master at the university of edinburgh um, they have a tradition of hosting a Thanksgiving ceremony um, where uh, the families of the donors they uh, they join the, the the faculty and the students in a ceremony to to share about the um, um, like a student's gratitude for the donors and their families. And this was it, I think it was a, a very important mo moment for me as a student to connect. Um, more with with my donors, um, sorry, with um, the donors in the anatomy lab, um, and to have more of a um, like a sharing um, memories and the sharing feelings with someone who knows these people, who knows these um, um, gentlemen and ladies in the lab, um, and I felt like it, it took my gratitude for for these um, generous people to another level. I felt like I don't only know these people now; I know their families. So. It's something that gives the student um, a feeling of gratitude, like a deeper feeling of gratitude. Thanks, Lena. And I, I think that's 
really one of the things that makes our profession so profoundly special is that it connects us to a whole community of, uh, of people, of um, really generous people who leave their remains um, for us to teach with, to study with, to advance knowledge, to share knowledge. Um, it, I find it really humbling, um, especially like when I look at the community here in British Columbia, where we've got people really passionate about um, healthcare and our healthcare system and the education of all of our students and sort of the generosity um, to uh, to participate in that in 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 that way. That's um, yeah, I, it's an aspect of of the privilege of what we do. I think. Yeah, absolutely. And should never be forgotten either. Yeah, yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both for sharing your stories. Um, this has been such an inspiration to to spend this time with you um, talking about everything from embryology and histology and its importance to understanding um, the macroscopic anatomy um, to the rotator cuff and Lena's somewhat not quite understandable love for the gut. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, and then ending on this really profound note of gratitude to, to the donors who make um, all of this possible. Thank you so much for your time and your generosity of, of being here. It's been a real pleasure. And thank you very much for inviting me to take part. Anytime. One day I might manage to get over to Vancouver. You never know. <laughs> we love that would Vancouver. be great. We would love to have you here. <laughs> Yes, yeah. that would be really great if you can make it. <laughs> yeah, it's also, uh, watch this space, as they say. Yeah. All right. That sounds great. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. All right. Well, thank you very thank much. You. All the very best thank to you, you. all. Right, bye just now. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shagun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time. <laughs>